Hey there, this is Dr. Jenkins. We are moving right on, moving on towards the pelvis and the hip. So now we have finished the upper body and now we're gonna start a unit with the lower body, starting at the pelvis and hip and then working our way down to the knee and then ankle and foot. So let's talk about the pelvis and the hip. If you look at your notes here, you can look at the characteristics. Both the pelvis and the hip are very stable. So we already began talking about this with the shoulder. You know, the shoulder and the surrounding joints were a little bit less stable, but it gave us more motion. So here we have more stability, so it's more stable, and we have less motion compared to the upper body. Why do we need to have more stability? Because here, we are carrying the weight of the body. Okay, pretty simple. Let's talk about the pelvis first. We're gonna talk about the pelvis. I have my notes here beside me to make sure I'm following along right with you. So this first video is gonna be like our previous verse videos, mostly about anatomy and kind of some functional anatomy. So for the hip and the shoulder, excuse me, for the pelvis and the hip, I'd like to get through in this video the basic anatomy in terms of what are the bones that make up the joint, the specific bony structures, what type of joint, what motions are available, some information about the ligaments, etc. So let's start with the pelvis. Um, you may see the name pelvic girdle. It makes me laugh. I always joke that nowadays it should be like pelvic spanks. You know the spanks? Or maybe they're not even popular anymore. I don't know because I'm getting old. Older. But the pelvic girdle refers to, so what composes the pelvic girdle? It is the pelvis and the sacrum, basically. So it's the connection of the pelvis in green. Let's go with red here. And then you remember, of course, this is the sacrum. So these bones together will attach to the spinal column, the lumbar vertebrae to be specific, and it will allow attachment of the femur. So make sure you review the functions of this girdle. This is how we attach the leg to the body. All these bumps and projections like the ASIS, like the iliac crest, like the AIIS, like the ischial tuberosity. All of these bony processes are here for attachment site for muscles. If we think about the pelvis, this kind of forms like a protective bone to support the developing baby in women. It even supports some of our lower abdominal organs. The fact that the femur attaches here allows for motion at the hip joint. And of course, this pelvis and the sacrum have to be pretty thick. So we're talking about bigger, thicker bones because we have to support the weight of the body. So make sure you are reviewing those. You know, why do we have this arrangement of the pelvic girdle, which is just the connection of bones between the pelvis and the sacrum? By the way, the pectoral or shoulder girdle was the connection of bones between the scapula, clavicle, there's one more, and rib cage. I had to think for a second. The scapula as it attached to the clavicle and the rib cage. So this arrangement of bones in both cases allows the limbs to attach to the body. In the shoulder, it was more about motion, but the pelvic girdle is more about stability and protection. So let's talk about the pelvis anatomy. This is gonna be a review from your own anatomy, so I'm gonna move quickly. We can look at the pelvis by looking at the pelvic halves. The fancy word for a pelvic half is innominate. You don't have to know that, but... And of course, these two halves come together to make the whole. Uh, I like this picture because it shows the three regions so make sure you review the ilium is the bigger region, kind of looks like an elephant ear. The pubis is the lower region that's anterior. The pubis is the lower region that is anterior. 
And then the ischium is the lower region that's posterior. This should be a review, so I'm going to move quickly. These are three regions. Of course, they all fuse together. Make sure that you remind yourselves that we have a lot of bony prominences. So we're going to be talking about those in lab. We're going to be palpating the ASIS, the iliac crest. We're going to be talking about some of the other specific bony structures as we go along here in lecture. We'll talk about the acetabulum or the socket. We'll talk about the pubic symphysis where the two pubic bones come together and so forth. You can see number two there. Um, both of these regions come together at the pubic symphysis. So if I use the same colors here, green is the ilium. Here's a lovely x-ray. Red was the pubic area or pubis. That's the region that's lower and more anterior. And the blue was the lower part that's posterior. Well, where the two pubic bones come together is the pubic symphysis. This is a cartilaginous joint where joints are joined together by cartilage. Nice and simple. Um, let's just identify some of the major differences between the male and female pelvis. We really haven't talked yet about structure being that different between males and females. But as a result of the, the hormones at puberty, and even a little earlier on, the bone structure is different. I have a lot of information here. Let me just tell you what I'd like you to know. In general, the pelvis of a female... I'm going to pause for a second. Can you guess which is female here, the lower left or right? This is the female. The female has a wider opening. And we can understand why. These changes are all adaptations to allow the female to carry a baby, nurture the baby, and then deliver the baby. Whereas the male has a more kind of oval, not oval, excuse me, a more up and down opening. It's a little bit more circular. Men have a more curved ilium. I'm so, uh, I cannot speak today. My apologies. A more curved coccyx. So this is the male. Males have a more curved tailbone or coccyx. Women, it's not quite as curved. It doesn't quite curve in as much because we need more opening for the baby to come through. And the female pelvis is a little bit lighter in density because typically it doesn't have to support as much weight, whereas the male body is usually heavier and therefore the, the bones of the pelvis will be a little bit more dense to be able to handle that weight. And it's all about childbirth. You don't need to know all the specific differences, but here are some if you're interested. Just review the ones that I just talked about. Okay, let's talk about joints of the pelvis. You may not know as much about these. The primary joint of how the pelvis connects to the sacrum is the sacroiliac joint. And of course, it's named for the bones it connects. So if you have a look at your notes, the sacroiliac joint, the joint is formed by the sacrum and the ilium, right? So here's the sacrum and then the ilium we talked about. So this is the joint formed by the sacrum and the ilium. Let me put the joint surfaces that touch in red, Right, so here is where those two bones come together. Sacroiliac joint. In terms of the articulating surfaces, you don't really need to get specific. If you wanted to get specific, we would say it's the lateral borders of the sacrum, articulating or touching with the medial border of the ilium. We don't need to know that. Just know that it's the sacrum and the ilium of the pelvis coming together. What type of joint is this? It is a plane or gliding joint. It is a synovial joint. And, you know, people don't really think about this joint, but it's pretty darn important. 
the sacrum is kind of the the bottom anchor for the entire vertebral column, and it's connecting with the ilium or the pelvis. So these are big, big bones that support a lot of weight. So this is an important joint. It is a synovial joint. And the specific type of synovial joint of the SI joint, sometimes you'll see it called SI, sacroiliac SI joint, planar gliding synovial joint. What type of motions are possible? I'm just going to say some gliding. It is a gliding joint, so we can expect there to be some gliding. But folks, this is one of the things that's a little bit kind of up in the air. If you talk to people, and I'm thinking about practitioners who might work with people who are injured and have limitations in mobility here, like physical therapists, athletic trainers, chiropractors. Some people think that there's a moderate amount of movement. Other people think that there's almost none. So it's a little bit up for debate. So I'm going to put a question mark here. Some think there's a moderate amount, a decent amount. Some think there's not much at all. But either way, we can agree that there's some motion. Okay. We're going to talk a little bit later about the supporting ligaments. I would just like you to know the category. So here we go. Let's see if I can find them on here. Okay. So we have a category of ligaments, kind of a grouping called the sacroiliac ligaments. There's an anterior one, and there's going to be a posterior one. I'm not going to ask you to label these specifically, but just have a look at these pictures. There's a lot of ligament support. There's a lot of ligament support. So what are some of the comments we can make? A lot of ligament support. We're just going to keep it simple. But there has to be. These are big, big bones supporting a lot of weight. So there's ligaments everywhere. The sacroiliac ligaments, well, aren't they going to run between the sacrum and the ilium? So these ligaments kind of run horizontally on the anterior aspect and also on the posterior aspect. Some of the bands go in different directions, right? Some go up like that, some go down. So it's a pretty big, thick complex. By the way, these pictures here, um, you can probably tell that they're old, and that's probably why I like them. <laughs> um, you know, for a, this is just a little history lesson. Won't be on the test, obviously. But for years and years, you know, there would be artists who were good at art and drawing or whatever, but didn't know a whole lot about science and anatomy. And then on the other end of the spectrum were people who were really knowledgeable in anatomy but didn't know how to draw. So the first guy that I'm aware of to really be uh, a science dude, science person, who was also artistic enough to really make good drawings, these are from the book by Netter. I know these days we really don't talk about um, books anymore because it's all online. But one of my favorite anatomy, anatomy books is a book by Frank Netter, the Netter book. And he's a physician, MD, but he was also really, really good at drawing. So I can give him a lot of credit. Um, other information you don't need to know what I'm about to say. Um, the anterior sacroiliac ligament, sacroiliac ligament's a little bit thinner, not as strong. The posterior has thicker bands. But I think we can see that just by looking at the picture. I'm not going to ask you that, but okay. Let's talk about the pubic symphysis. So our first joint that we just talked about is the sacroiliac joint. Now we're talking about the pubic symphysis. And we've already, we've already described it a little bit. The pubic symphysis is the joint where the two pubic bones come together anteriorly. 
there is a fibrocartilaginous disc in between. This is not a synovial joint. It is a cartilaginous joint. The sacroiliac joint, the hip, the shoulder. Those are all synovial joints with a joint capsule, with all of that. But this is a cartilaginous joint. which means that it's a joint connected by cartilage. The, we'll talk about that more in a minute, but let's, let's talk about this fibrocartilaginous disc. Fibrocartilage is the strongest type of cartilage. Don't we want really strong cartilage here? Yes. So the purpose of this is shock absorption. Not only is it a connector, but we need some shock absorption as we're walking and putting all of that weight down with every step that we take. So its functions would be shock absorption and then, of course, connection. This is a cartilaginous joint. What kind of motion is allowed? I wouldn't even consider it gliding. That's more of a synovial joint motion. We're going to say give or flexibility. Usually with cartilaginous joints, the terms we use for motion are more about give or flexibility. It may not even be discernible to your eyes. But because of the weight bearing, it's helpful here to have a little, little bit of give. You know, you may remember the other example I gave you for a cartilaginous joint was the joint between the rib cage and the sternum. So don't we want the cartilage there to be able to give or flex a little when we breathe in? Similar idea here. Okay, now we are going to get a little bit more specific in terms of pelvic movements. Now, stick with me here. We're not yet talking about the hip. The hip is going to have our familiar motions, right? The hip is going to have flexion, extension, abduction, adduction. But we don't have those similar motions here at the pelvis. We got oddly shaped bones kind of coming together in this weird gliding joint. Um, and then the pubic symphysis isn't really going to allow a lot of movement. So let's talk about movements at the pelvis. So there are a couple of things that I want to point out. One thing I want to point out is the pelvis... Here, let me, let me rephrase this. The pelvic bone. So not only are we talking about the ilium, ischium, and pubis, but we're also talking about the sacrum. They work together as one. This is different from the shoulder. If you remember the shoulder, yes, the joints in and around the shoulder work together, but they kind of... They didn't act as one unit. In other words, we talked about the um, scapulothoracic ratio to glenohumeral joint, right? The glenohumeral to scapulothoracic ratio. For every two degrees of glenohumeral motion, there was one degree of scapulothoracic. As we were doing that, the, um, the, the clavicle moved a little bit on the acromion, but it wasn't together as one. Each, each part, some parts move less, some parts move more, some parts didn't move at all. So different in the shoulder, different joints moved at different times. But here, the pelvic bones work together as one to create these motions together. So we're going to talk about a forward or anterior tilt, a posterior or backwards tilt. We know we can rotate. We know we can do rotation. And we can also do a lateral tilt to the side or lateral rotation. I think you can imagine rotation when you actually rotate at your pelvis and then a lateral tilt to the side is like a side bend, right? But these are probably new to you. 
think about the anterior and posterior tilt. It's kind of like if you're doing, I don't know if you've ever done, you know, some rehab exercises or if you're doing some core exercises. And sometimes they'll ask you to do this, kind of tilt your pelvis back, posterior tilt, or move it anterior. We're going to practice this in lab. But we can kind of move the pelvis anteriorly. We can shift the pelvis posteriorly. What I also want to point out is not only do the pelvic bones work together as one to create these motions, we also have to consider that this is also involving the lumbar spine. Because doesn't the lumbar spine attach anchor at the sacrum? So we can't do any pelvic motions without motions of the lumbar spine. So like in the anterior tilt, not only does the pelvis kind of rotate anteriorly, but there's also going to be some lumbar flexion. In the posterior tilt, not only does the pelvis kind of rotate posteriorly, if this were to continue back a little bit, there might be some lumbar extension. But I would like you to review these and then the motions possible. Anterior tilt, posterior tilt, rotation, and the lateral tilt. Okay, this shows you how they all work together. And I didn't even get to the hip joint. So not only do our pelvic motions, anterior tilt, forward tilt, same thing, backwards or posterior tilt, lateral or rotation, not only does it also incorporate some lumbar spine motion, we often have some associated hip joint motion also. You don't need to know all of the specifics. I'm gonna give you one example in, a, in the next slide, and it's actually in your notes too. But right now, let's just talk about the big picture, right? When we talk about the bones of the pelvis working together as one, to do an anterior tilt, posterior tilt, lateral tilt, or rotation, it's rarely, it never happens individually on its own. It's always going to be accompanied with some lumbar spine and some hip motion. They all work together. Let's talk about that one example here. The one example that I did put on your notes here talks about the combination between hip abduction and a lateral tilt. Hip abduction, so if I look at the lateral tilt of the pelvis, there's almost always going to be associated hip abduction. So I'm not gonna ask you everything in this chart, but as an example of how these pelvic movements often have lumbar and hip motions associated at the same time. You don't have to know all of them, just know one. When we have, let's say that, in this picture, it's trying to show you left hip abduction. This is that person's left hip, right? When this, if this left hip were to abduct to the side, there would be a lateral tilt to the pelvis. I mean, if I lift my, if I lift this leg, left leg up, it's natural that the pelvis is going to shift down laterally. And actually, if you want to get really specific, you don't need to know this, but if you're really interested, usually the pelvic motion is secondary. It's the hip motion that's initiating it, and then the pelvis kind of moves secondary to it. All right. Let's identify some other anatomical structures in this area. And one of them is the inguinal ligament. I know we're down near the crotch, but so be it. Ha ha. The inguinal ligament is basically right in the underwear line. And here I'll put it in green. It's on either side. It's a thick ligament. It actually runs from the anterior superior iliac spine, the ASIS all the way down to what's called the pubic tubercle. You don't need to know that. 
but know the basic area. So it runs kind of in the underwear line and it kind of hugs the bottom part of the pubic bone there. What are the functions? Well, the number one function is support. We have a lot of things here. We've got muscles, big, huge bands of arteries, veins, nerves, lymphatics. We have your abdominal organs, right? Your intestines are up here. For women especially, some of the reproductive organs are up here. So we need a lot of support. It holds these muscles in. Support, support, support. It holds in the abdominal organs. So support for muscles organs. Actually, some muscles can attach to this ligament, the inguinal ligament. So another function is muscle attachment. If you really wanted to, you could palpate this on yourself. Right in your underwear line, you can feel if you run your finger back and forth, a thick, it's like a thick rubber band. If somebody has a hernia, a hernia just means protrusion. So there can be like a hiatal hernia coming from the stomach up into the esophagus. Herniated disc is when the intervertebral disc herniates or protrudes out past where it should. An abdominal hernia, hernia is usually through the abdominal wall and sometimes through that inguinal ligament or through a portion of it. I'm not going to ask you this but you may have heard of this before. And athletes can actually get hernias if they are doing a lot of lifting of heavy weights. There's a lot of strain when you sometimes hold your breath right before or just a strain in general. So a lot of pressure builds up in your abdomen. And the abdominal fascia, this connective tissue, can weaken. The pressure builds, it weakens this tissue until eventually your intestines come through. That's not fun. <laughs> All right. Oh, there's a real one. So what we're seeing with the hernia here is this. These are the these are the intestines. The intestine should be up here. Bilateral because it's on both sides. These this protrusion should not be there. All right. So we did the pelvis. Our two main joints for the pelvis were the SI joint, and then we talked about the pubic symphysis. Um, there we go. Now we're going to talk about the hip joint. The hip joint is, what do I have next here? The hip joint is otherwise known as, and it's listed here in your notes, the acetabulofemoral joint. Like everywhere else, these, joint, these joints are named for the bones they connect. You do need to know the articulating surfaces, or the joint, was a joint is formed by. It's formed by the head of the femur, big head of the femur, articulating with the socket in the ischial bone, otherwise known as the acetabulum. The socket is the acetabulum. It looks like it's spelled ace, but it's acetabulum. That's how it's pronounced. Head of the femur. This is a deep socket. The opposite of what we talked about with the shoulder, which was the glenohumeral joint. In the shoulder, it was the head of the humerus articulating into the glenoid cavity of the scapula. Well, here, it's the head of the femur articulating with the acetabulum of the pelvis. Deep socket, strong. A lot of articulating, a lot of bone-to-bone -bone contact. Um, an extra piece that you don't need to know, the if you're wondering, the acetabulum, that socket, it's actually angled a little bit anteriorly and a little bit to the side laterally. You don't need to know that, but that's true. This is, of course, a ball and socket joint, just like the glenohumeral joint is, and the same motions are possible. Flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, internal, external rotation, and circumduction. So same motions possible here as possible at the glenohumeral joint. 
although not to the same extent, right? Here we have more stability and less range of motion. The glenohumeral joint had more range of motion with less stability. Let's talk about some of the supporting structures. Do I have a picture of the cartilage? Let me see. Ligamentum teres. All right. Like any synovial joint, there's going to be some articular cartilage. Which picture do I want to use? So on this picture, let me, let me try and show you what I'm talking about here. In this picture, the articular, the hyaline cartilage, we know that every synovial joint, the ends of the bones are lined with syno, um, hyaline cartilage. Here, the hyaline cartilage is shown as blue. And maybe I'll do it in a different color so it'll stick out more. But you see it's blue there. I'm going to highlight it in red. So it's a little padding, right? So like any synovial joint, the hip has some hyaline or articular cartilage. But what I want to point out is it's thicker on the edges. So the hyaline cartilage is thicker here and here. So it's, if, if I was going to draw the articular cartilage, it's thicker on the edges and, nar and narrower in the middle. So the hyaline cartilage is thicker at the edges. That's just to give more support. The joint capsule, like every other synovial joint, there's a covering of connective tissue. I've described it in the past, kind of like um, saran wrap, but like many, many layers of saran wrap that co covers all the joint surfaces. These are synovial joints, they have fluid in them. So don't we need some kind of capsule to encapsulate and keep the fluid in? In the hip with the joint capsule, we really do have this vacuum-like seal. I mentioned it a little bit in the shoulder joint that there was kind of there was kind of a little bit of a vacuum-like seal, but to a very small degree. The hip joint has much more of a vacuum-like seal. This really makes the connection even stronger. With the hip joint, it's all about stability. Stability, stability. It's got to support a lot of weight as we walk and move around, stability. So not only do we have a deep socket, big, strong bones, but also this vacuum-like seal. You can see there in your notes, I'm not going to ask you this on a test, but the joint capsule is strongest anteriorly. Just a little FYI. All right, let's talk about ligaments. Okay. For the hip joint, I would like you to know we have three main ligaments and then a smaller ligament called the ligamentum teres. I'm looking at my notes here to see where I want to go. Yeah. Good. So we're going to get to, we're going to finish the anatomy of the joints, which is exactly where I want it to be. All right. Let's talk about the ligaments. There's three big ones, three main ligaments, and they're strong. Three main ligaments and they're strong. The iliofemoral, what's lovely is that they describe exactly where they go. The iliofemoral ligaments run from the femur to the ilium, and they have multiple bands. Because of the shape of the bands, sometimes this is called the Y ligament. I don't know. I'm not going to ask you that. But Oh, yeah, because it's an upside-down Y. That's right. As I did that, I was like, wait a minute. It doesn't look right. It's an upside-down Y. See if I can do this. It's my upside-down Y. So these are longer and bigger. This is a little shorter. I'm not going to ask you that, but this is the strongest. 
So just know, I'm not going to ask you to label, but just know what bones it connects. And the name gives that away, right? Iliofemoral goes from the ilium to the femur. Strongest. Extra information here is it's there to mostly limit hyperextension. And these can also help to maintain posture, but that's kind of a side thing. So just know it runs between the ilium and the femur. It's the strongest. Let's talk about the pubofemoral ligament. We know the pubic bone is on the anterior side, so we're also going to see this. This is an anterior view, right? And as the name suggests, he's not too challenging. This goes between the pubic bone and the femur. From the pubic bone to the femur, pubofemoral. If you want to get all specific, it goes from the ramus of the pubis, which is this, to the intertrochanteric fossa of the femur, but you don't need to know that. Just know where it goes. As an extra information, this is more of a limiting thing for abduction and extension. Fine, fine. But the one that we can see on the posterior view would be the ischiofemoral because the ischium is on the lower posterior part. Ischiofemoral runs between the ischium and the femur. This one kind of has the most oblique direction, kind of at an angle or forms like a kind of wraps around. And I want to bring this up because this direction plays a role. So these three ligaments together, and it's particularly true of the ischiofemoral, instead of the ligaments just being straight across between the bones, they're not that, right? Instead, they kind of go like this. So because of this, these ligaments, and I'm going to write it down as I'm saying it, ligaments help to keep femur, head of femur, let me be more specific, help to keep head of femur twisted into the socket or acetabulum. You see how the, the ligaments kind of run at an angle and they kind of twist, they keep that head of the femur twisted into place. So I would like you to know that. It is especially true moving from flexion to extension, but this is just another example of strength and stability. Big joint surfaces, vacuum-like seal, thick outer articular capsule, and the diagonal arrangement of these ligaments kind of twists and it keeps the head of the femur kind of twisted in place. Really cool. Now, there is another smaller ligament. So we've just established the three main ligaments, iliofemoral, pubofemoral, and ischiofemoral. But there's a smaller one, but it's really important, called the ligamentum teres. The ligamentum teres is a ligament that runs from the head of the femur to the acetabulum. Let me see, it's probably easiest to see in, let me go with like yellow. I think that's gonna be easy to see. The ligament is right here. So it runs from the head of the femur to the socket or the, the bottom of the socket here. This is a ligament that runs from the head of the femur to the acetabulum or socket. So it's not really big, so it's not going to be functioning for stability. Now, during when you're younger, like really young, it does help with growth a little bit but and stability, but now it doesn't, right? This is a smaller ligament. It's not going to help with stability. Here it is as well, right? It kind of fans out from that view. 
So it's not really about stability. But what does it do? The function of this, it does just help to attach. So it's not really stability. But it is helpful to have an attachment between the femur, head of the femur, and the socket. And it is a route for blood vessels. And this picture on the right really shows that. The white thing is the ligament. But then what do we see right here? Oh, you can't see that. What do I see there is a little blood vessel, particularly an artery. So it's attachment. It's an attachment site, but also it, sorry, someone came to my office door and I was a little distracted there, my apologies, but it's also a route for blood vessels. Because of this, okay, if you fracture the head of the femur, so imagine, you know, the femur is a big strong bone, so it's not that often that it fractures, right? But if it does, and I'm thinking like a car accident or a skiing accident, something with where you can generate a lot of force. If it does, isn't it likely to fracture at the smallest width? It's not going to fracture at its thickest width where it's strongest. It's common to fracture at the neck because that's the narrowest. And actually, we can see some femoral neck fractures, some stress fractures with runners or gymnasts. So it doesn't have to be necessarily a macro trauma. It could be small trauma over time. But if you have a fracture here, we know bone heals well, but if you, excuse me, if you fracture that, you might be cutting off this blood supply. And it can lead, have you ever heard of necrosis? Necrosis means tissue death, but it can lead to something called avascular necrosis. So this is a worry, right? Okay, here we can see um, a normal ligamentum teres on the left and the right. Um, yeah, like this whole thing is a ligament between the head of the femur and the acetabulum. It's kind of cool. Okay, um, you don't need to know the range of motion. A couple more things. We'll talk about labrum and then the bursa. And then we'll get you out of here for this video. There is an extra piece of cartilage called the labrum. Didn't we see this in the shoulder? Yes. Similar idea here. Not only do we have the articular cartilage, we also have an extra added piece of cartilage. Shock absorption. Shock absorption. Um, you know, we used to think that this wasn't really injured very often because it's such a strong, stable joint and it's a thicker joint, and there's not the same forces and torque here as compared to the shoulder. However, what we've noticed in the last 15, 20 years is um, we can tear this labrum. Uh, Alex Rodriguez, former Yankee player, in my, when I was younger, and when I was in college, I should say, he was playing for the Texas Rangers. But A-Rod, he had a labral tear in his hip, had surgery. Um, so it's becoming more, we're noticing it more not an injury that I would want, um, but yeah. So shock absorption deepens the joint. Last, oh yeah, there he is. Here's that little piece of torn labrum there. Okay. Last thing I want to talk about would be bursa. We already know what a bursa is. It's a fluid-filled sac. You know, we have these in areas of high friction. So even though there's not as much motion as the shoulder, there's enough motion here. So we have some fluid-filled sacs to help eliminate friction or reduce friction, I should say. You don't have to know them specifically, but just know that they exist. Um, the one that I am going to point out that you might you know, resonate the most with would be the trochanteric bursa. We're going to palpate in lab the greater trochanter. The greater trochanter is this lateral bump here. Well, muscles run right alongside that greater trochanter. This is your tensor fasciae lata, right? 
So as that muscle contracts and relaxes, as you abduct and adduct, this is an area of high friction. So maybe you've heard of trochanteric bursitis, inflammation of this bursa. So just know that they're here, what they are, what they do. Fluid-filled sacs in areas of high friction there to reduce friction, and that we have a several in and around the hip. All right, when I see you next, we'll start with muscles.